Hello everyone, welcome back to the series on A-Level English Literature. Everything you see in this video is taken from Mr. Brough's Guide to A-Level English Literature, which is available for £4.99 at mrbrough.com or on amazon.co.uk. It was written by Mrs. Spag, aka Curry Lewis, who also wrote the best-selling grammar guide. We're still looking at AO1 and we are looking at how to write a coherent piece of work and in the last video we looked at some of the things to do with coherent and accurate written expression but today we're getting down to introduction and conclusion. Many students struggle with introductions and at all costs you need to avoid the clunky and boring in this essay I am going to discuss. You need to make an interesting point. A GCSE I think you know, often we're taught not to write introductions or conclusions or to have, you know, one line introduction because it's a, um, there are no marks awarded for the intro or conclusion and the piece is so sort of quick and relatively simple that it, you know, you can just get straight into it or have one line introductions. But at A level, of course, the jump up, we're doing much more uh, sophisticated analysis and we need to, you know, really introduce what it is we're writing about. So how do we do this? Well, you state your point of view or your hypothesis in a clear, concise way. And we call this a thesis statement. And it is usually one sentence. And then you spend the rest of the essay justifying or proving your thesis statement. If the exam question starts with a quotation, you could summarize it in your own words and link it to the question and then follow it with your thesis statement. So let me give you an example. Let's have a look at this one. Blake's poetry explores many facets of love. How far and in which ways do you agree with this view? Okay, so let's imagine that's the question. You might write Blake's presentation of the different and sometimes contradictory forms of love will be explored by examining poems from selected poems. I agree that his poetry explores a great many facets of love, but there are also limitations. Now see how this isn't really vague. I see a lot of introductions that are vague. Um, that might just be something like um, Blake explores lots to do with love in his poetry. But your introduction has to have something to it that sort of points at what you're going to write about specifically. So for example this last bit there are also limitations. It just gets a little bit more precise than this kind of overarching vague introduction. This is a very short introduction, but it does focus on the question and it does have a thesis statement. But a more sophisticated way to develop an introduction would be to begin with a relevant quotation. And this could be linked to the keywords of the question and then lead to a thesis statement. Let's have a look. Explore the presentation of men and women in Pride and Prejudice. So this might be a nice little uh, introduction. The subject of men and women is introduced in the first sentence of, the, of Austin's Pride and Prejudice with the ironic observation, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. This introduces the idea of rational marriage, which is based on economic arrangements. But are all men and women presented in such a mercenary light? I believe that some are, but others are not. So in this example, we can see the introductory quotation is a good way of introducing one aspect of how men and women are presented. It leads to an important point about marriage and then leads seamlessly to the thesis statement that opens opportunities to cover a wide range of points about relationships and also to disagree with the question. Another way of structuring an introduction is to contextualise the question by linking it to the background and then following with the thesis statement. Explore the presentation of women in sense and sensibility. In 19th century English society, middle and upper class women did not enjoy the same level of education as men as they were expected to marry and have children. Prevailing attitude centred on a woman being weak and not capable of rational thought. This is a view that was challenged by Mary Wollstonecraft in a vindication of the rights of women in 1792. Austin explores contemporary discussions about the nature of women in sense and sensibility. Eleanor Dashwood, with her intelligence and practical outlook, represents sense, and her emotional sister Marianne represents sensibility. The use of antithesis to present women will now be explored. 
Now, whichever method you prefer, remember that a successful introduction is short, establishes basic facts or a fact, and contains a good thesis statement. And this is the foundation for the rest of your essay. What about the body of the essay then? Well, you need to link your topic sentences explicitly to the keywords of the question, as this will help you to maintain focus. It's very easy to drift off into writing everything you know about a text rather than answering a specific question. You might know how your points connect, but you won't be doing yourself any favours if you expect the examiner to read your mind. So every paragraph must begin with a topic sentence which links to the question. It's worth noting that in the process of writing, you might explore points which were not in your plan. And this is more likely to be the case if you're writing under pressure in an exam. But as long as your points are relevant, that's fine. You don't have to stick to your plan exactly. And the fact that you're developing your thread of discussion or argument throughout an exploratory approach shows the examiner that you're analysing the text and engaging with it in a personal, creative way. You need to assume the examiner has read the text, so there's no need to narrate the plot. You should focus on quoting and interpreting, and we're going to deal with uh, those skills in a future video, and of course they're covered in the ebook. There are some useful discourse markers when you're writing to signpost your ideas to the examiner so you can see how your argument is developing. The whole list is in the ebook, but you might have for introducing ideas, you might have things like to begin with or primarily. For developing ideas, you could have my initial impression is this, but actually this, or upon further examination, or having considered this point of view. Uh, you can have concluding ideas such as having considered the evidence, or it's important to conclude with, or weighing up the evidence, we can see that. And that brings us on to the conclusion. So. The biggest thing with a conclusion is you don't just want to repeat the points you've already written in your essay, but you also don't want to introduce new material. How many of you have had that feedback? You know, the new idea pops up in the conclusion. It's, it's no good. Um, what you've got to do is reference back to the exam question, weigh up your thoughts and either confirm your original thesis statement or refine it. Let's have a look at some examples. Uh, Cleopatra is a manipulative woman who brings down a worthy soldier and ruler. To what extent do you agree? Explore the way Shakespeare presents Cleopatra. We might have this as a conclusion. To conclude, I believe that it is unjust to label Cleopatra as manipulative and to blame her for Antony's downfall. This would depict her as an unscrupulous schemer, and there is more infinite variety to her character than that. The play is a tragedy, and this choice of genre highlights the downfall of both protagonists who have to deal with the political consequences of their love. Cleopatra is a woman in love, and although foolish at times, she does not have the malice and scheming ways of Lady Macbeth. As mentioned earlier, Antony is not entirely a worthy soldier, having ignored Enobarbus' sound advice to fight on land where he has the advantage. Moreover, Antony's decision to follow Cleopatra when she panics at the Battle of Actium is what ultimately leads to his downfall. Like Cleopatra, he's not perfect, but he's certainly not a victim of a manipulative schema. Another way to end a conclusion is to include a quotation that summarises your point of view. And this can be a powerful technique if you have an appropriate and relevant quotation to hand. Uh, Yeats has commented that um, passive suffering is not a theme for poetry. How far do you agree that Owens' poetry is too preoccupied with sentimentalising the soldiers? You could write something like this. Finally, when Yeats sneers at Owen, it is because the former believes that soldiers should be described as tragic heroes, rather passive victims. Owen aims to challenge this view and is quick to criticise those who glorify war, dulce et decorum est, those who do not understand shell shock, mental cases, and those who die of exposure in the trenches. Exposure. I disagree with Yeats's assessment that of Owen's poetry as we all sentimentalise soldiers, and I believe that it is our duty to do so. This is seen in the annual remembrance services on 11th of November, which help us to remember the sacrifices of the doomed youth from the First World War and the soldiers who fought and died for us in subsequent wars. As Owen states, my subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. 
Your conclusion finally might also move beyond the core text to consider wider significant issues. So in this one, which was explore the ways the character of Scrooge is used to convey Dickens's attitude towards the poor, you might write, in conclusion, more than 150 years after the novel was first published, the theme of charity in A Christmas Carol is still relevant today. As the old saying affirms, money cannot buy happiness, and Scrooge learns that it is kindness to others, and the poor in particular, that brings rewards. Dickens stressed the importance of considering others, and perhaps more people in society would benefit today if they took these maxims to heart. Now, however you structure your conclusion, remember to express yourself concisely. A conclusion summarises your ideas, so it doesn't have to be very long. Of course, the final stage of writing an essay is that one that many people overlook, and it is allowing time to check your work. Effective time management is the key, and could result in the extra mark that might raise your grade. Now, I have to say that... If you look back over an exam answer that you've written, you will probably be horrified with some of the simple mistakes you've made. So you've got to work on building in time to go back over your work to find those mistakes. It's better that you be horrified and correct them than you give a uh, poor impression to the examiner.